practice concentration or mindfulness. We spend a lot of time focusing on the technique, where to focus your mind, how to stay with the point of your focus or the theme of the meditation, how to work with it so the mind can begin to settle down. And stay settled down. Even skills for how to leave meditation. All of these are skills, techniques we can work on. But it's not what the meditation is all about. A lot of the technique has to lie in developing your powers of observation and your own ingenuity. You look at some of the steps the Buddha taught in breath meditation, being aware of the whole body as you breathe in, breathe out. Learning how to calm the effects of the breath on the body. How to breathe with a sense of rapture, a sense of pleasure. These are the tasks they sets for you, but it doesn't tell you how to do it. For that, you need to use your own powers of observation, your own ingenuity. Partly because the steps are going to be a little bit different for each person, and partly because one of the purposes of the meditation is to develop those powers of observation and ingenuity, because those are the powers that are going to lead to discernment, learning how to pose useful questions, and then figuring out how to explore so that you can come to an answer, because those are the skills that you're going to turn in. Focus on the problems in your own mind. And talk about discernment as being the ability to see things in terms of the Four Noble Truths, using the Buddha's teachings on the inconstancy, stress, and not self. Those are the general outlines. But each of us has his or her own specific problems, the things that cause us to suffer. Some people are overconfident, some people lack confidence. Some people find it easy to get the mind to settle down, but hard to gain insight. Others find it the other way around. And so it's important that we learn how to use our own individual powers of observation, ingenuity, to solve problems so that we can solve our own particular problems. Again, a larger understanding and a more specific understanding about where we cause ourselves suffering and how we can stop. That's the general outline. And as the Buddha points out, it's ignorance and clinging and craving that cause the suffering. But where are you going to find your ignorance? It's right there in your own mind. But part of the nature of ignorance is that it's hard to see. So instead, the Buddha has you focus on specific places where you're causing suffering and then work back. And one of the huge areas in our lives is our relationships with other people. How do you cause suffering around that? And how do you use the teachings to apply? First off, of course, it's important to understand what the teachings are. You hear so many different versions of what the Buddha teach, teaches or taught. It's good to go back to the sources and look what the Buddha himself had to say about what were his most basic teachings. He uses the word in one place, categorical teachings, the ones that are true across the board. It turns out there are only two teachings that he labels that way. One set of teachings is the Four Noble Truths that we chanted just now. Looking for the stress so you can comprehend it. And comprehending means watching it to see exactly where it's coming from. When you see where it's coming from, what activities in the mind are causing the stress, you learn to abandon those activities. And then you notice the times when stress ceases, or at the very least it goes quiet. 
and you try to realize those moments. Because all, all too often when we're dropping, say, one craving, it's just so we can pick up another one. And we don't notice the times when the mind really is relatively free of stress. So we can begin to see when the craving comes, when it goes, when the ignorance comes, and when it goes. Which will help us gain the insights that ultimately allow us to fully realize the cessation of stress and suffering, i.e. there will be no more stress and suffering in the mind. And then there's the path that leads you there. Notice the path doesn't cause the end of suffering. The end of suffering is a it doesn't cause nirvana, let's put it that way. Nirvana is something that's totally uncaused, but the path leads you there. And the basic elements in the path are virtue, concentration, discernment. And these are things you want to develop. You don't just sit back and watch them come and go and learn to accept their coming and going. You actively try to figure out how do you give rise to more virtue. More concentration, more discernment. Once it's arisen, how do you maintain it so you can depend on it? These are tasks that the Buddha sets for us. And these are the basic tasks that underlay everything in the path, everything in the practice. On another level, a little bit closer to home, is the other categorical teaching. What's skillful and what's unskillful. And here the Buddha is quite specific. It's largely a matter of virtue. No killing, no stealing, no illicit sex, no lying, no divisive speech, no harsh speech, no idle chatter. And then there are the inner virtues for the mind. No excessive greed, no ill will, no wrong views. So if anyone ever asks you what the Buddha's basic teachings are, it's these two sets of teachings, the Four Noble Truths and the basic teachings on what's skillful and what's unskillful in thought, word, and deed. Those are the teachings that are true across the board. Particularly with respect to wrong views, the Buddha says you've got to straighten out your views, understanding that action really does have results. And the results can be immediate and they can be very long term. And on top of that, it's what you do is something you actually choose. You do have freedom of choice within certain limits. It's not the stars acting through you or some outside forces. You're making the choices as to what to do and say and think. And it really does make a difference. This is why the Buddha, at the end of his life, emphasized the teaching on heedfulness. He says, you've really got to be careful about what you do, what you say, what you think, because it has consequences. Now, if you were not able to have any control over your actions, he wouldn't teach heedfulness. Or if everything were wonderful, he wouldn't teach heedfulness. There are dangers out there, but you do have the ability to avoid those dangers. And it's because you make the choices that there is a virtue in generosity. It's because of you have the ability to make choices that you owe gratitude to your parents, because they made choices too. The people who've looked after you, they chose to be helpful. And you always have to appreciate that, have gratitude for it. As the Buddha said, if you don't have gratitude for the good things that other people have done you, that you're, you can't really be trusted to be a good person yourself. So these are some of the principles that underlie making your views straight. Now the reason our views get crooked, as the Buddha said, is there's, there are four reasons that our views grow off course and our actions go off course. The four forms of bias. One is bias in terms of liking or desiring. 
In other words, there are people we like, people we want to help, people we want to please. And in our desire to please them, we do things that are really not the right thing to do. And you really have to be careful about that, because that's a huge amount of pressure in society, in a relationship, or your many relationships. The people you love, you want to please them. And the Buddha says, you always have to keep the precepts in mind. Make sure that they're more important than pleasing the other person. Because pleasing in a moment is a poor trade for abandoning your precepts, abandoning your principles, which will cause harm down the line. And the pleasant results that may come from pleasing someone in the moment can easily turn into something else when, say, the two of you or a group of people work together on some project that really is unskillful. And then everybody has to live for the results of that unskillful action. And what happens is they usually turn on one another. So this is another principle of wisdom or discernment is always make sure that you go for the long-term happiness and not for the short-term. So you can avoid this kind of bias, the bias of wanting to please. The second form of bias is the bias that comes from aversion. There are people you don't like and people you want to get back at. They have wronged you and you want to see them suffer. And here's a case where you really don't have to do anything. If you want to see them suffer, they will suffer someday, maybe a little bit, maybe a lot. But you don't have to get involved, because if you get involved, then it's going to be your karma. If people really have done wrong, the principle of karma works out. So at some point down the line, they're going to suffer. Maybe they may be suffering actually in the course of doing that wrong thing. But that doesn't mean that you have to get back at them. You have to protect your virtue. And that's the categorical teaching. Ill will and aversion have never solved anything. third form of bias is the bias that comes from delusion. And one of the major forms of delusion is you're, you're afraid that somebody else is going to harm you, so you do figure out, well, I'm going to harm them first or stop them. Of course, what that means is now the, the, the karma is yours. You know, if it's unskill, often it's unskillful karma. Lots of areas where we really don't understand the situation, but we think we do. And again, this is a really hard one to, to guard against, which means you have to be very careful in observing, well, when you have acted in the past, what were the results? So many cases where we, we act and we get bad results, and yet we still stick with that action. I think it was Einstein who said the definition of stupidity is thinking you can do the same thing and we get different results. We have a lot of bad habits, and a major source of delusion is thinking, well, the bad action is the only alternative. We can't even imagine ourselves acting in a different way. And this is one of the major cures for delusion, is learning how to imagine yourself reacting in a different way. Someone does something that you find hurtful, and you have an automatic reaction. If you know that sort of thing is going to happen again and again and again. You stop and think, what can I say the next time around? What can I do the next time around? So as not to react in an unskillful way. Imagine the other possibilities. This is why it's good to have developed ingenuity as part of your meditation. You learn how to think outside the box. You realize that regardless of the situation, there always is a skillful alternative. It always is a skillful choice, but sometimes it takes some thinking to get there. 
This is why one of the parts of right effort, as the Buddha said, is to prevent unskillful qualities from arising. Which means you know beforehand that a particular situation draws out unskillful habits in you. And so you prepare yourself. Next time this happens, let's do something else. Next time this happens, post a warning sign in your mind that you've got to act or think or speak in a different way and plan things through. Years back when I was staying with a John Fuang, one of my jobs was to clean his hut in the evening. If there was a time during the day that, or any issue that came up during the day, that was the time to talk to him when the hut was all cleaned. He'd had his bath, I'd washed his robes, he'd be having his cup of tea. And if there was any issue that came up that I had to deal with, that was the time. And sometimes I'd bring up an issue and he'd come back at me with a retort that closed off the conversation. Sometimes those retorts were pretty stinging. And I began to realize it wasn't just his mood for the day, it was I had actually said something wrong or approached the topic in a wrong way. So I figured, well, it's an important topic, we've got to talk about it. And the next day, I'd, on my way up to his hut, I would try to figure out what's another way to approach, approach the topic. And if I got it right, there'd be no problem in having the conversation. So this is an important part of the pra practice, is planning, knowing that situations are going to come up, and actually planning what you're going to do, not just leaving it to the spur of the moment. Because usually in the spur of the moment, the alternatives suddenly disappear, and all you've got are your old habits. So if you know there's a situation that causes trouble, sit down and think about it. What would be a better response? This helps get through not only the, the bias that's caused by delusion, but also the last of the list, which is bias caused by fear. You're afraid of your boss. You're afraid of your spouse. You're afraid of what will happen if things, if you do something that they don't like. And so as soon as a difficult situation arises, the fear kicks in and that closes down all the alternatives. So on the one hand, you have to remind yourself the biggest thing to fear in life is that you're going to abandon your precepts, that you're going to abandon your virtue, that you're going to stray off the path. The treasure of having the path, or the qualities of mind you develop in the path, that's more important than any external treasure. So when a situation comes up that you think might be causing you to or feel tempted to abandon the path, you've got to think it through. Okay, what exactly am I afraid of here? Which is the greater fear? Which is the greater danger? And in some cases, you'll be able to figure out that there are more skillful alternatives which don't cause danger on either side. And if it turns out that there's no clear, diplomatic, skillful way through to get take care of both sides, then you say, okay, there's a, the greater danger is abandoning the principles, abandoning the path. And be willing to put up with some difficulties. Because this is where the path really shows its values, is when things get difficult, you've still got something really solid and valuable inside. And that's something you never want to abandon. So these are some of the principles to keep in mind as to what right view is and where we tend to stray away from right view and right practice. And a lot of the practice is, on the one hand, keeping these principles in mind, and then secondly, being observant and using your ingenuity on how to stick with these principles in all the difficult and complex and uncertain areas of your life.
if you can be clear on these things. And if you can take the difficulties not so much as obstacles but as challenges. And you come out ahead. For instance, the precepts put up certain barriers. Again, it's not a commandment coming from the Buddha, but it's just his observation that if you break these precepts, you're going to suffer, you're going to cause harm. So you want to keep the precepts in mind and then use your ingenuity in applying them. So the, simply the practice of the precepts right there it develops mindfulness, it develops your discernment. Because discernment isn't just cloning what you read about wisdom in the books. Discernment is figuring out how to do the skillful thing, given the situation. It's strategic. It's a skill. Which is why we work on not only mastering the techniques of meditation, but also using our ingenuity and powers of observation to make them skillful, because then we can use those powers to develop skill in other areas of our lives as well. <laughs>